Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode on my channel, The Dissenter, and today I have a very special guest for you. It's Dr. Lee Jessim. He is a distinguished professor, chair, and graduate director of the Department of Psychology at Rutgers University, and he also runs the Social Perception Lab there. He is a leader in the fields of person perception, stereotype accuracy, and bias, and has been inter integral in the Initiative for Viewpoint Diversity, which advocates to correct the inaccuracies in the field of social psychology research. In support of the latter, he helped start Heterodox Academy, a collection of academics pushing for improvements in their respective academic fields. So, Lee, thank you a lot for accepting the invitation. It's a pleasure to have you on. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. That was a great introduction. Thank you, Ricardo. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so today we're going to talk about stereotypes and their accuracy or lack thereof, right? So, uh, where did this thing about stereotypes being, being all the time absolutely negative and unuseful comes from? Was it generated by uh, Walter Lippmann in the yeah. 90s? Yeah, it all, I mean, uh, yeah, I think so. I think this started with Lippmann. And Lippmann, like, wasn't wrong, right? I mean, he he was a journalist, basically, a news guy. And so he was, wasn't was really a social scientist. It's not like he was dealing with data. And, you know, he reasonably looked at the ways in which groups were often characterized in political discourse in ways intended to either advance or undermine the, the, the interests of certain groups. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, that's put mildly. I mean, sometimes groups are heavily, heavily stigmatized and all sorts of horrors were, you know, were justified um, in this sort of political discourse. And so when Lippmann was writing about the sort of evil ways, sort of the evil nature of stereotypes. He was talking about the, the, the ways they've been sort of politically exploited for propaganda purposes. And that's true. That, that's absolutely, anybody who was paying, ever, ever pays any attention in any country knows that that happens. But, so, and that's an important point. That's not, you know, who would want, I don't want to, I don't want to ignore or dismiss that, that truth. But, I'm a psychologist. I'm not focused on um, insulting political cartoons that depict someone's race or ethnicity in a degrading way. I mean, that's important, and I'm glad people do that. But, but as a psychologist, I'm interested in what's inside people's heads. Average, everyday people, you know, college students, bus drivers, lawyers. Uh, I, you know, supermarket workers. I just like everyday average people. I'm not, my interest is not primarily politicians or the media. And once you try to get inside people's heads and ask them what they think about groups, you know, sometimes you get this some nasty stuff. It's not like it's all peaches and roses inside people people's heads either. But by and large, Usually, not always, people's beliefs about groups correspond reasonably well when there are well-measured characteristics, right? So some stereotypes that you can't really measure. So of course, you can't talk about those as being either accurate or inaccurate, right? If there's no way to assess it, it can, you know, so, so, and that's important because one, the history of declaring stereotypes inaccurate is itself unjustified not only when stereotypes are accurate but when stereotype accuracy can't be assessed so this is kind of one of the critiques of stereotype accuracy as well not every stereotype can be the accurate you can't assess the accuracy of every stereotype well okay i agree that is an absolutely true statement that removes from the person making the argument the ability to say it's inaccurate because there's no criteria so all this makes me crazy. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> and, and look, how do you study stereotype accuracy? To what sort of information do you compare stereotypes that people have that are directed usually at other groups of people in order for you to know if their content is more or less accurate? Right, right. So that's the sort of a prime, one of the primary questions, just to understand how this is done. So, you know, there is an abundance of sort of reasonably impartial, more or less objective information in places like the census. So, you know, most countries will have a census of their populations on you know, education levels and income and uh, geographic distributions and occupation and just all sorts of characteristics. Likely, I mean, Countries handle it differently, and I'm most familiar with the United States, but, you know, it's easy to get incarceration levels, likelihood of uh, relying on social welfare, having a high school degree, having a college degree, you know, and these are not the only parts of people's stereotypes, but people absolutely have beliefs about groups regarding these kind of characteristics. So that's one source, sort of government records in general, of which the census data is a prime example. It's not the only example, but it'd be a prime example. But then, for many characteristics, you know, the social sciences have now been around for 100 years, and you have, in some cases, meta-analyses of scores or hundreds of studies that compare groups, whether it's men or women or blacks and whites or whatever the groups might be. And so there's pretty good scientific evidence regarding the ways in which some groups, not all groups, but some groups, are similar or different, even on things not in the census. So whether it's, you know, score on, yeah, score on, on standardized math tests or scores on IQ tests or not ability to com- uh, communicate non-verbally, uh, cooperativeness, there's like meta-analyses on a slew of traits like this that you can then compare against people's beliefs about groups. So that's meta-analysis is the second. And the third is self-report. You know, everybody knows self-report has problems or or certainly limitations, but sometimes self-report is based on highly validated self-report scales. So that's pretty strong evidence, actually. But when, you know, that evidence isn't always there, but it is there sometimes. So it's really those three things, sort of impartial, more or less impartial government records like the census, meta-analysis of group similarities and differences on lots of traits, and in some cases, self-report. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we already established here that it is not a useful scientific endeavor, let's say, to simply assume a priori that stereotypes are inaccurate, right? Yeah. And okay, but but the, but the question I want to ask you is. Uh, but it, it is also not really useful to assume, for example, that uh, stereotypes are most of the time correct. That is, we have to evaluate case by case, case, the, by case. the percentage of accuracy of each stereotype, correct? That's right. And not just each stereotype, because that makes it sound like the stereotype is like a thing out there. It's each person, right? You know, you have your stereotypes, I have my stereotypes, Fred has his, Barbara has hers. Just yours and mine might be perfectly accurate, but that doesn't make Barbara's accurate. I mean, each person can be accurate or not. And you can reach, you can make, reach conclusions about what the literature shows. The literature in general shows X. In this case, X is, well, you know, the stereotypes that have been studied have, and the way they've been studied have usually been at least moderately accurate. But that's on average. That, that's not like even every person in those studies and lots of things haven't been studied. So you're absolutely right. You should make not just no one should make any assumption about the validity of any stereotype, either in general or held by any particular person without evidence of its accuracy. If I say it's going to rain tomorrow, like, OK, maybe I was right yesterday. But that doesn't mean I'm right about tomorrow. It's, this is like every this is so simple in real life. Any belief has to be evaluated on its, you know, the evidence for its validity, not like some sort of general statement. But it is still interesting that after a hundred years of just sort of declaring stereotypes inaccurate, the evidence is not consistent. That is actually interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, that's really interesting. And look, not, not to address some of the worries that people express. 
uh, when they're thinking about the way stereotype might uh, stereotypes might negatively affect other people in terms of intolerance and things like that. Uh, the, uh, do the does the literature say something like uh, along the lines that stereotypes affect the perception that people have uh, both of the people that are part of their in group and also peoples from out groups yeah well it probably in general is experienced as annoying as presumptuous to discover that somebody makes assumptions about you based on stereotypes even if they're flattering stereotypes right because how do they know they don't know and the answer is they don't know so when one is kind of targeted or even victimized is a little strong by but by someone else is being presumptuous about who they are or what their characteristics are. I get that. That's kind of offensive. Like, judge me based on who I am, not based on your assumptions about my group. So, so that, you know, I buy that. Now, the, the truth is, that the, or the evidence is, that people actually do that most of the time. So when people have, information about uh, an individual's personal characteristics you know what that might be their accomplishments or their achievements or their personality or their style whatever it is they almost completely not completely but they really very heavily judge the person based on their personal characteristics far more than they do on stereotypes but Sometimes you don't have that information. You don't always have the information about an individual's personal characteristics, and then people will, in fact, sometimes. So that's, you know, so that's from the standpoint of a target, or, you know, the person being stereotyped. Mm -hmm. Given mm -hmm. the evidence, it seems to me that at least most of the time that's been assessed anyway, that stereotypes don't really do all that much for the in-group. That they're, they're a cognitive, you know, they're, they're, they're more, co stereotypes are more cognitive than motivational or, or more cognitive than ethic. They're people's beliefs about the world. And, you know, it, it's always possible that those things can be biased and biased in self-serving or group-serving ways. And sometimes that happens, but the evidence is it doesn't happen very much, at least with respect to beliefs that have accuracy criteria. Now, it might be different when there are no criteria. You know, when, when we're talking about, well, who's more moral? Or, you know, it's, you can't really, it's not evidence. Um, you can say who's more likely to be convicted of a crime, but you can't really say who's more moral. Right? So it may be that these fuzzier things are more likely to be sort of in-group biased to make me believe my group is better than some other group. But I don't think so. I think the primary driver of that is actually not stereotypes. I think it's actually, it, it's affect, it's motivational. And that's separable from the stereotype component. So people often want to believe that their groups are better than other groups. That I, that I believe. I think there's good evidence. But that's mm -hmm. an, an attitudinal, emotional thing. That's different than their beliefs about the characteristics, of groups, which is the stereotype component. So, yeah. So mm -hmm. the existence of accurate stereotypes does not invalidate or even contest the existence of in-group favoritism and in-group bias. They can and do exist side by side, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I, I think that another very important thing that people have to know about stereotypes and how they function, isn't it also true that 
um, most of the time. I, I, I'm not sure if it's most of the time, but at least it, I think it happens many times that when people are exposed to information from particular individuals that violates the stereotypes that they hold in their heads, that they are able to at least tweak a little bit the the way they deal with that particular person that is vi sort of violating the stereotype. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's there. There may be exceptions, but by and large, I, I think that's the case. I think the evidence is that that's the case. So certainly, from a person perception standpoint, people judge others on their characteristics, on their merits and their characteristics. And when you combine that with the very weak evidence for the predictive validity of things like implicit bias, what I suspect is going on, that there's probably lots of things going on, but one of the things that I think is going on is that if people are judging others primarily on their merits and their personal characteristics, it crowds out bias. You know, there's just not that much room left for bias. So it's not that biases don't occur or can't occur. There are times that they do and they can, that's for sure. Um, but that wasn't your question. Your question was, do people sort of adjust their responses to someone who disconfirms the stereotype? And I think the answer to that is usually yes. Not always, but usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and is there a lot of evidence for stereotype threat? That is a lot of evidence for uh, uh, for what some people what some people say that happens when, for example, you uh, how, how do you say it? Oh, you prime uh, people that are part of certain particular uh, right. identity groups, and before they go and do a test, for example, because, because they are told beforehand that they belong to this group, and people from this group uh, usually don't do as well in right. the test that they're going to do, then that has an effect on their performance, for example. So is it really uh, true, that phenomenon? Right, okay, well, so you sort of asked two different questions, which you may not have even realized were two different questions. One was, is there a lot of evidence? Two is, is, is it really true? And the answers are different. There is a lot of evidence. There's been scores of studies claiming to show the reality of stereotype threat. I think there are good reasons to be skeptical about the validity of those studies. So you probably should separate stereotype threat into two broad domains. It's more than this, but kind of like stereotype accuracy. It's fine it to be assessed on its own merits, but the most common ways in which it's been studied is stereotypes regarding women in math and STEM, you know, women in science and math, especially math. So the idea is that if you prime gender stereotypes in some way that uh, because you know, some of this is done with, with uh, pre-college students. So girls or women in math, it will undermine their achievement because they buy into, in some sense, or they're aware of the cultural stereotype that girls and women are not good at science and math. And this is threatening and it supposedly undermines their achievement. It's pretty clear that that is not true. And the reason, even though there's lots of studies showing that it is true, the reason it's pretty clear that it's not true is first, there have been now a couple of pre-registered tests. So the, the you know, sh should I explain pre-registration? Sorry? Should I explain pre-registration? Uh, yes, it's better for the audience. Okay. Yeah. okay. So um, when a study is pre-registered, that means the researchers create really a, a document saying what the hypotheses are, what the methods are, and what the analyses, what analyses will be used to test those hypotheses in an upcoming study. Pre-registration is important because it allows everyone to distinguish between confirmatory and exploratory data analysis. The problem with 
and both are fine. There's not really science in principle, scientifically, confirmatory and exploratory analyses are fine. The problem is the field, social psychology in particular, probably psychology more broadly, and other fields, probably including biomedicine, have had a problem where researchers have fished around for a statistically significant result and then retroactively claimed that that's what they predicted. If you perform enough, it's this is like throwing dice. If you throw, you know, two die repeatedly, eventually you're going to get two sixes. And if you only focus on the time you at the two sixes, you say, look, I have ESP, I changed the dice. See, that proves I have ESP. But you don't have it. You're just you're, you're pretending you predicted it when you didn't. Pre-registration eliminates that problem because you have to outline up front what the key analyses are. So you can't fish around for a statistical result and then claim you predicted it. Okay. The pre-registered tests of stereotype of women and stereotype threat, you know, women in math and stereotype threat, have all failed to find anything. There's just no evidence for it in pre-registered studies. That strongly suggests that the large prior literature showing showing seeming to show stereotype threat was probably a function of sort of statistically cooking the books and selective reporting of studies. So if I'm some famous researcher and I have lots of resource, resources, I can run 20 studies and, and just not report the 17 that didn't work and only report the three that did. If I reported all 20, there'd be on average no evidence of an effect. But I'm only report the scientific literature only has the three that work. So that's publication bias. So between publication bias and sort of statistically cooking the data, which people probably do unintentionally, like they're not, you know, they're fishing around trying to understand their data. And then they're telling a story or a narrative around the data. So that doesn't make it sound so pernicious, but it's, it's insidious because it allows people to unintentionally cherry pick results to create the impression that there's more of a finding than there really is. So that, to me, that seems to be the most likely explanation for why we have a very large literature showing stereotype threat effects on women in math, but pre-registered studies don't find the effect. In addition, there are at least two meta-analyses. So these are um, reviews that st statistically combine results from lots of studies that include tests for bias in those studies. When you take measures to, as much as you can, no one can do this perfectly, but when, you, when these meta-analyses ha have taken measures to eliminate the biases in the underlying studies, they also show little or no stereotype threat effect for women and men. So you put this together, the pre-registered studies aren't finding it, the meta-analyses with good tests for bias aren't are finding either little or nothing, I'm pretty sure there, there ain't much there there. That's women in math. The, the, the other area is race and intelligence, intelligence or cognitive ability testing, SATs, GREs, IQ tests. And that literature has a clear problem and an unclear problem. So the clear problem is that most of those studies used a technique called analysis of covariance to test for the effect. Without going into all, all these technical details, there's nothing inherently wrong with analysis. There are good reasons to use it. But the statistical technique created the false illusion that when you remove stereotype threat, black and white test scores were the same. This was a statistical fluke that resulted from using analysis of COVID, which, you, which I you can see this, using the same technique, analysis of covariance, I showed 
with real data that the yearly average temperature in Tampa, Florida, and Nome, Alaska were the same, which is ridiculous because you know Tampa is really warm. But through the magic of analysis of covariance, you can eliminate the difference, the pre-existing differences between the temperatures to make it look like controlling for prior temperature, there's no difference. In the same way as controlling for prior achievement, there was no difference. But there were, there were very large prior achievement differences. So you're controlling away the original differences between blacks and whites. So, okay. So the, the, the start hit threat and race work never showed what it's often claimed to have shown, which is that remove threat and black and white test scores. It never showed that. It could be true, maybe, but no one's ever shown that. That work has not, I haven't seen any pre-registered attempts to replicate that. I would very much like to see a pre-registered attempt to replicate the race and stereotype threat work Given the problems with stereotype threat and women in math, I will remain skeptical, not certain, but skeptical of the race and stereotype threat finding until such pre-registered replication. That's my stereotype threat story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, and and another thing that another thing that comes frequently associated with stereotypes in the stereotype literature and particularly in the social psychology literature that assumes that stereotypes are inaccurate are self are self-fulfilling prophecies so what what do you have to say about that Do oh my god -fulfilling prophecies really happen that regularly when people supposedly deal with groups of people on the basis of the stereotypes that they have right yeah, yeah. So, you know, th there's like two different issues. For me, there's two different issues. Do they happen? Yeah, I think they do happen, actually. I think self-fulfilling prophecies occur. So self-fulfilling prophecy, just so like everybody knows, what, what I mean by it occurs when one person has a false expectation for another person and then treats that second person in such a way that causes the person to confirm the stereotype. And so even though my belief or the person's belief might have been wrong to start, it ends up kind of true because the person acts in a way that confirms it. So self-fulfilling prophecies were first really empirically sort of discovered in the late 60s with teachers and students, where in this classic study by Rosenthal and Jacobson, they misled teachers to believe that some of the kids in their class were going to be late bloomers. And by late bloomer, what they meant was that those kids were going to show dramatic increases in intelligence over the course of the year. But these kids were just picked at random. They were no different than anybody else. But in this study, sure enough, on average, by the end of the year, those kids showed more stronger IQ gains than did the other kids. So this is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Teachers had an erroneous belief about which kids were smart or going to show these gains, and somehow those kids showed greater gains. Okay, so that study was really controversial when it first came out. There were lots of attempts to replicate. To replicate. There were meta-analyses. Then there were studies of real-world teachers and students. And results are pretty consistent. Self-fulfilling prophecies do occur, actually. They're just not very powerful on average. They can occasion, like most of these things, they, let me, they can be powerful once in a while, but they're not usually very powerful. So when I say very powerful, on average, in a classroom, the um, the, let's say there's a classroom of 20 students. Self-fulfilling prophecy might substantially change the achievement of two of those 20 kids. Now, if you're one of those 20 kids or the parent of one of those 20 kids, that could matter a lot. But that's the same thing as saying that teacher expectations have no effect on 18 of the 20 kids. 
So all that's important because for decades, including not all that long ago, social psychologists wrote about self-fulfilling prophecies as if they were powerful and pervasive, as if they, and this is a quote from the handbook of social psychology, as if they dictated people's life patterns. Those are ridiculous statements. There's just not a shred of evidence for any of them. And there's a lot of evidence against most of them. So, you know, I think self-fulfilling prophecies occur. And I think, you know, for a, a normal person, for your average everyday walking around, you know, it's like, it's like an average person walking around, that self-fulfilling prophecies occur is actually something you can use. So if you ever work with people, you know, people under you or with you, you're probably better off, you know, you can't always do it, but your default assumption should be to hold people to a pretty high standard. And if you, because it's sort of well, pretty well known how self-fulfilling prophecy, at least how achievement-based self-fulfilling prophecy, that when positive ones occur, Teachers hold kids to high standards, but they also provide the support that sort of helps kids meet those standards. So if you have high standards with low emotional support, you're just like a cold, hard badass, and that doesn't really do anybody. Else. If you're emotionally supportive without holding people to high standards, well, you're nice and everybody will like you, but nobody's going to actually accomplish anything. The combination of holding people, whether they're students or people working with you, some of this stuff has occurred, you know, there's good evidence that this occurs in the work world also, not just in teachers and students. If you hold people to high standards and you're emotionally supportive, you have some chance of elevating people. And that, that's just a great message. And it's just, it's not, nothing's ever easy, but it's not really that hard either. So yes, they occur. On average, they're not that powerful. Your average everyday person can actually use it. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, and now another topic, because there's this thing nowadays about people that are, for example, part of a company, a progressive company, let's say, and they, they and then they have to go through some anti-bias training. And I oh. mean, <laughs> I, I mean, you can you can talk a little bit about these anti-bias trainings but, uh, but, be, but before that yeah. isn't, isn't it true that uh, it might even be a bit dangerous for people to okay le let's see now I go through an anti-bias training and after that I am convinced that I no longer hold any sort of <laughs> stereotype about, uh, about other groups of people and even about my own group and things that I identify with or not and things like that so i mean isn't it a bit stupid to say the least to put the information in people's heads that something that even have an innate aspect to it because i mean people have to categorize things in order for them to properly process information even so right. that that if they go through this anti-bias training or something like that that they then uh, are completely expurged from any sin <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. Yeah. So there's been very little research on the effectiveness of that. There's been some research that to me suggests they're not likely to be very. So um, there is this sort of very extensive attempt uh, I'm not sure if it's published yet, to change people's implicit biases. And what that work showed was you can change people's implicit biases measured by the implicit association test, and it has almost no effect on their behavior. So if you're putting people through implicit bias trainings, and implicit bias, you know, changing their implicit biases has little or no effect on the behavior, it's kind of wasting everybody's time. But on the other hand, you know, the lack of research on this stuff doesn't mean it's all bad. I mean, it really means we don't have much evidence on it. And I suspect there is more going on 
than the desire to reduce or eliminate people's prejudices. And because there, if that's true, if there's more going on than that, then, then the people who count, the people who bring in and hire implicit bias training companies don't really care. If that's true, and I'm not saying it's not true, but don't really care whether bias is reduced. But, it, but if that's true, if they don't really care that bias is reduced, then the fact that these things, if those, these interventions don't do anything, it doesn't really matter because that's not their purpose. If their purpose, which I strongly suspect, is it includes this sort of political mix of things. If you're, a, if you're a company, you know, you're perennially subject to discrimination lawsuits. But if you can point to look at our culture of implicit bias training, you can say, you can defend against such a suit by saying all sorts of things. Look, we're deeply committed to fighting discrimination. Um, uh, we have used the best known practices for doing so. And so, you know, if, if ever there was a company that was already taking steps to eliminate discrimination, it would be our company. So there's that. Then there's the public image, right? I mean, by showing the world that your company takes discrimination and oppression seriously, you know, that's going to have more of an appeal than if you don't do that. So none of that has to do with, you know, th these trainings don't actually need to accomplish anything in order to accomplish those goals. So if they don't accomplish anything, no one really cares because that's not their real purpose. So that, I mean, that's a very cynical view of what's going on, but, but I have a very cynical view of what's going on. Because if you actually cared, if someone actually cared about reducing prejudice and discrimination, one would try to identify practices that are either more plausibly or well demonstrated at showing such biases are reduced. And that it just doesn't seem to be that much of that going on. But there are practices that reduce discrimination. I mean, they're, they're, some of them are moderately well known, but they're very different than these implicit bias traits. So yeah, I think they're, I, mostly I think the trainings are window dressing. They're either window dressing or punishment. So I have an email from a guy at a, one of the, at another university, I think that's all I want to say. He would not want me, me to out, out him. Where if they don't hire enough diverse faculty who meet their sort of diversity standards, they get thrown into another implicit bias training. So it's effectively used as punishment. So this is not like, you know, it, it's not manifestly used to actually address problems of nation as far as I can. And then probably some people believe in them. I mean, I, you know, certainly in psychology, there are a lot of people who believe that implicit biases are a real and powerful thing and that they need to be combated. And, you know, I think there's, there's some evidence for their reality. I think implicit bias is not completely made up, but like so many of these other things, like self-fulfilling prophecies, like stereotype threat, I think it's been wildly oversold. There's a, probably a there there, but it's just not this um, major source of inequality that it's often cracked up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess we have to test them a lot more to see which of them work and which don't, and then try to apply the ones that do, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah, and, and, now, and now another thing, that, and because you also refer to this in your books and your edited yeah. books and even talks, and because you're also part of the Heterodox Academy, so... Is social psychology nowadays, do you think that it is still uh, too much under the influence of, uh, let's say, uh, people that uh, have a take on science 
as if they have to use it with the end goal of promoting leftist political activism. I well, Things like that. Yeah, so I think there are a small number of people in the field whose advocacy drives their son. Yes, I, so I think that's real. I think that happened, and there's good reason to think that was the case with implicit bias. And implicit bias is big. I mean, it's big in part because of that. Big in the field. Um, I also think it's often it that the, I think there's a real problem of the political skewing and distortions in the science. In the science. Forget the people in the science, in the publications, in the claims, in the conclusions, in the canon, you know, the, in the received wisdom of the field. I think it consistently skews in an unjustifiably left direction. So, yes. I think that often works in a more subtle way than the simple advocacy driving conclusions of the science. I think advocacy driving conclusions in science happen. But I think many of the ways in which the literature is, now I use the term distorted, but sometimes it's not completely wrong, but it's skewed. So like in the three examples we just did, implicit bias, self-fulfilling prophecy, and stereotype threat, all three of those in my opinion, have been wildly overstated in the general conclusions of the field. But why would that be? Why would all three of those be wildly overstated? And, you know, maybe the people making these statements believe them. So they may be doing the best they can. Nonetheless, they're still wildly, in my opinion, they're wildly overstated. So that begs for an explanation. And what it appears to me, I think the most likely explanation is that the many of the people in the field are concerned about reducing inequality and eliminating discrimination and all that kind of stuff, which you know, those are laudable goals, social action goals. And, Demographic-based discrimination is usually not a good idea or justified. People shouldn't be have their opportunities limited by the fact that somebody doesn't like their group. That strikes me as kind of whack, actually. But, but all that being true doesn't justify overstating social science conclusions. But those social science conclusions, all of them, the power of stereotype threat, of self fulfilling prophecies, of implicit bias, constitute use, useful sort of social political rhetoric in the you know good fight against inequality. So I suspect that people, people, social scientists, social psychologists, have been for a long time and on average are far less critical of work that seems to, you know, combat oppression than work that, you know, says, well, you know, maybe it's not as bad as you thought. That doesn't, that's not helpful in the fight against oppression. That it's not as bad as you thought. So, so, yeah, I think in a small number of cases, you have advocacy driving conclusions directly. People know what they're doing, and that is what they're doing. And in other cases, it's just much more subtle. That is, people on the left, in some ways, think fundamentally differently than people on the left. And, you know, I think sometimes the left, some of these fundamental things are actually have more going for them than people on the right. I think other times people on the right actually are onto things that people on the left. The 
For example, for almost 50 years, social psychology has emphasized the power of the situation. So in thinking about what causes people's behavior, you can think, well, it's their personality, it's their attitudes, it's what they think, and then what's how they're motivated, something about you or me. But you know, if I go out and play tennis, your assumption is that I like playing tennis. That's something about me. Right. The power of the situation idea is that no, 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 no. People's behavior is primarily a function of their context, of you know how their wealth and their power and their you know the, the 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 other people who are around them and their physical environment. All of these things. These are aspects of the. They're not aspects of me. They're aspects of my situation. So the reason I play tennis is not because I love tennis. It's because I'm surrounded by tennis players, which primes tennis. And so it's easy for me to go play tennis, so I go play tennis. That would be a power of the situation type argument. Okay. okay. It, it turns out that there's a small number of researchers who have compared what predicts behavior, situations versus personality. And they're pretty comparable. It, you know, there, there's just situations absolutely do matter, but so do things inside the person. Okay, so why did the field get this so wrong for so long? Well, I don't know, but people on the left tend to focus on situations that, that you know, what, what explains inequality? Well, it's history and it's oppression and it's, you know, all these, you know, sort of government policies and it, it's, you know, it's people's social, you know, why does some kid from some such and such a background not do well in school? Well, it's not because the kid is not smart. It's because they've grown up in difficult social conditions. That's a classic left-wing explanation. Right-wing explanation is, no, the kid is either lazy or stupid. Right? It goes right to the person. Okay. So most likely, and I think most reasonable people would agree that both of these things are actually in play. But this, my field's emphasis on situations for such a long time is, to me, the classic kind of distortion that comes from left-wing politics. That if the field was more balanced, then possibly the view of sort of the psychology of the individual as a function of both their personal characteristics and their situations might have emerged much more, much more quickly. But for, for now, you know, it's, I'm not even sure the word has gotten out. There are some people who will acknowledge that a person is just as powerful a predictor as of, of their behavior, the person, their attitudes, their personality, their motivations, their characteristics are just as powerful predictors of their behavior as are their situations. But lots of people will still emphasize the power. Of so I think that reflects as much as anything, the left-wing skew of the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And an another thing about that, and it's interesting that you refer to the situational slash contextual aspects of social psychology over the last few decades, because, I mean, uh, it is obvious, I think, uh, nowadays, for, and coming from fields like, for example, evolutionary psychology and evolutionary anthropology, and I've been talking a lot with people from those fields that uh, all of our aspects, physical or psychological, have to have a, a stronger or weaker innate component to them. So it is pretty obvious that, that it, it is all based on biology at some level and it's not important to be discussing here if it's weaker or stronger. Right. That, that varies a lot. But right. and anyway, uh, the differences between groups of people also have to have that innate component and if people don't address that then they might be creating some sort of fantasies surrounding the reasons why people from this or that group behave in certain ways and they might not even properly help them solve their issues that, that that's one side of the question and then the other side is if you have this sort of social constructivist approach uh, to things and focusing solely on the 
situational slash contextual side of things. Uh, I mean, at a certain point, you have to refer to reality because there's <laughs> something out there that it's influencing people, right? So it can't be all completely socially constructed. Well, yeah. So, so, right. so you know, I think when you come, so let me do your first point first, which was on potential evolutionary or biological basis group difference. I think most of that is still poorly understood. So, I would not be confident making strong claims for either an evolutionary or a biological basis for most differences between most groups. And that doesn't mean it's wrong. But it doesn't mean the evidence is super strong. The evidence is growing, and I think, you know, I just don't have the ethical problems that some people have with studying potential evolutionary bases for group differences. Gender differences, or so people don't like the race construct because the race has been. You can make a strong case that the concept of race has been heavily socially constructed. It's clearly been what people mean by the term race has changed over time. And that's vividly, clearly true. That seems to me to be a different point than the question of whether people whose ancestors evolved on different continents have different psychological characteristics on average. However, you want to talk about that. And I don't think that's a ridiculous thing for social scientists to want to try to understand. We're evolutionary biologists for that. Sure. Um, but I don't think it's all that well understood. Uh, you know, I, I think there's been enough change in conventional wisdom on a lot of these topics over the last 30, 40 years that I, we need a lot more. Uh, I think we need a lot more to be before anybody would be confident. Now, saying you can't be confident, you know, that, to me that means you can't make confident claims that it's all constructed and a you know, function of social sort of social forces, and you can't make strong statements about most things being evolutionary or biological. It's it's a it's probably a mix. Some, some things might be purely socially constructed. I'm okay with that. I you know that there may be no biological basis for certain things. And then there may be for other other things, but you know I'm not really I'm not I'm not as I say not really I'm not an evolutionary psychologist, so that's not really my expertise. Um, I do follow some evolutionary psychologists who I think do good work. There's a I think the attempts to dismiss evolutionary psychology is just so stories is unjustified. Um, but that's different than saying there's mountains of evidence clearly showing. All of it. So anyway, that's that. You had a second point which I now lost in my. Sort of, um, oh yeah, it was related to the fact that I mean, at a certain point, even social constructionists, pure oh. social constructionists, have to refer to right. something yeah. out there. Ah, that's right. That's right. Well, so I. Even though there is some truth to, I think there is some truth to social constructionist perspective. I think so. You know, so that when they say the meaning of race has changed over the last hundred years, they're right about that. That's you know, anybody can see that for themselves by just going into like the U.S. Census data, and it's like different racial groups constituted different racial categories. So they're not like you know, they're not completely wrong. But at the end of the day, me. If everything is socially constructed, then you're unmoored, as you're saying, you're unmoored from any reality. And so to the extent that social constructivists are making claims about reality, there, to me, their perspective becomes logically incoherent because there is no so reality independent of the social construction. So then, you know, it, it's, something can't simultaneously be true for me and the, op and it's something can't simultaneously be true if you and I believe opposite things about it. 
So it could be true for, true for you in some sense and true for me, but like that's not really what science deals with. Science, I mean, psychology can deal with the differences in the subjectivities between you and me. That's absolutely part of what psychology is about. But, but, the, but what is actually true, what is ultimately actually true can't be different for you and for me. The gender reality has to be the same. So to me, social constructivism ultimately kind of falls apart from its own, its own contradiction because if social constructivists are, are making a claim that power relations you know, produce some, some outcome or some, some inequality, well, they have to believe that the power relations exist as does the inequality. But if if nothing exists independent of the construction, then it doesn't if it doesn't really exist. So if it doesn't exist, how can that, and so on? It just falls apart. To me, it falls apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so just before we finish the interview, let me just put this out there <laughs> to be clear, because after what I said. Uh, there, there uh, will have some S SJWs after me immediately <laughs> calling me racist, sexist, homophobe, trans, uh, Trumpist, and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just, probably yeah. inevitable. That's, even that's going to happen no matter what. So go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but just to put this out there, uh, I was absolutely not saying that everything is strongly biologically based, but also because I already had people like um, behavioral geneticists on the show. And of course, they also refer to the fact that there are gene environment interactions and gene right. environment correlations and That's things right. like that. So it, there's not any one trait, even a purely physical one like height, Right. That, that is 100% under the influence of genetics. So, That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. so but I guess that what I was trying to say when I said that uh, all things have a biological basis is that even uh, information that we receive from the outside and have to process. Is Absolutely. In, in the, everything about us is biological. It ha everything about us has to fundamentally have a biological basis. It, it, obviously, we're, we are have evolved to interact heavily with our environment. That is also true. And you, you're, you're just touching at that. But at the end of the, each individual is a biological organism. It, all of this has to be functioning at some biological level, even if it's not yet well understood. That has to be true. Yes, and the, the pure social constructionists, they don't deal with that. They don't, they, I mean, it's not even like they deny it. They never get to addressing it. They just pretend like that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So I guess that was what I wanted to <laughs> say to say and to leave said on the record because yeah. <laughs> otherwise people will immediately yeah. come after me and things yeah. like that. So okay. well, if you can say this enough, I'll do it anyway, Ricardo. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm already expecting that. <laughs> but, but okay, j just to reinforce the point, let's say. Okay, so Lee, it, it was really a pleasant conversation. Just before we go, yeah. can you please share with people where they can find your work online? Oh, well, uh, probably there's three places. The... Um, Three best are my Rutgers website. So if you go to Rutgers Psychology and search for me, I should come right up. And actually, if you do a Google search on my name, I think all of these will come up really quickly. So this is Rutgers Psychology. I have an active blog series at Psych Today. I blog under Rabble Rouser because, you know, these ideas annoy people and I know they annoy people. And it's like, that's kind of embraced annoying people to some degree. So, so Psych Today, Rabble Rouser. And then I'm very active on Twitter under Psych Rabble. So it's like psych rabble, one word. Um, and most of that is actually social science and social science discussion. And, you know, you can sometimes find social psychologists, perhaps including me, behaving badly uh, on Twitter because we get into arguments with each other. Um, and so it's sort of interesting for either a lay person or an undergraduate to see these like usually dignified professors going after each other in ways that are sometimes fairly undignified. So, so yeah, it's like Twitter, Psych Today, and Rutgers. Those are the three best ways to contact me. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. And I guess ju that just for people to know, I guess that the same reason that led you to uh, 
uh, shoes uh, rab rabble rouser uh, rabble rouser as an handle for twitter was the same that led me to choose the dissenter <laughs> as the name for my channel <laughs> well i know that was an appeal to me when you first contacted me despite my delay in getting back to you that that, that appealed to me right away i have to admit so <laughs> yeah yeah okay great so lee again it was really a pleasure to everyone i really appreciate your work and i hope you keep up with it it's very interesting and important and so thank you again for taking the time to come on the show thanks for having me ricardo it's been fun hi guys thank you so much for watching this video until the end I would also like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and see if you can make a pledge there. I would really be thankful for that. And finally, I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanche, Per Helga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gelinas and Jim Frank. Thank you a lot for all.